Go ahead and make your oh, it's okay. I'll make a quick announcement. So the mic array is right here at the ceiling. Okay. It's um, incredibly sensitive and will pick up anything and everything. So um, not that there would be any sidebar conversations, but if there are, you really need to exit the room so that the recording doesn't get messed up for anyone who's trying to actually hear the flow of the meeting, essentially. So, uh, but bear that in mind. So just because there's a mic, not isn't a mic in front of you, doesn't mean they can't hear everything you're saying. Oh, no. Is there a camera? Yes, and the camera is and mostly we, trained at the front so they can see what we're working on. Are we on live? People have zoomed in? Yes. They can yes. see there, so we yes. can tell. You can tell. So if, if they join team, the team's meeting, and then yes, they're seeing it in real time. Uh, welcome. Um, good morning. Um, I don't have a lot of stuff prepared because this is my first one. So I'm here to learn, and um, but I'm really looking forward to this, kind of going over the goals. I see a lot of good things there. And... Um, I'm really interested to see how, how, you know, how we've been doing, how we're tracking our progress and how we can tweak these and um, uh, with some new council members too. You know, we'll have a little bit of a different view on some stuff. Hopefully we can add a new perspective. Um, again, I'm learning. So anybody feels that there's something they think that I can, can really benefit me helping looking into this, reading that, uh, please help. Uh, please all help my computer. Uh, is there anything else I should go over? Is there anything else that we need to cover logistically wise? Um, I think everyone probably noticed what the restrooms right there um, if needed. And then obviously you have the agenda of what we're planning to do today. We're bringing in lunch. Um, I don't think there's any other logistics to discuss. And then if you're interested at the end, there is a tour of the building if you haven't seen it and you want to. How far along is that building? It's probably not open today. I don't think you can tour no, sure that way. Yeah, right. But they don't have off. Yeah, oh. no occupancy. Is there any other part of this that I need to be prepared no, for? No. Thank you. I try to make it really uh, like low barrier to entry. Okay. I know this is what you guys are giving us a Saturday to, to be here. And it's a big commitment for, especially for counselors who are volunteers in this role and also have other jobs and commitments. So we have the prep. I appreciate the time that those of you who are able to spend with me ahead of time, it really helps to prepare and frame up some of these conversations and know how to structure the agenda. Um, so that is the preparation. And so I thank you all for your time in that. And hopefully um, you'll see that this, this agenda will, I, I hope, meet your needs as we move through this work. Alex, was there anything else that you wanted to say? I don't think so. I just want to thank everybody for being here and just let you all know, um, particularly for the counselors that are new, maybe aren't really familiar with this process, that this is really important for staff because we use this session, your goals, the things you identify to help us build the budget for the next year. So right now we just wrapped up the audit. We have not really even put a lot of thought into next year's budget yet, but we're just starting to. And so that's why we actually timed this now so that we could start building the budget around your priorities to the best of our ability, given our limited resources. When do you think you find out what the state has given us? Do we know that yet? Is it did we already know that they're uh money from the state this year for budget like our state shared revenues? yeah i mean is that a two-year budget so do we know how much we're getting from taxes already or will that come out around our budget time um here do we have anything from them yet we haven't gotten anything official from them okay yet there is a set you know three percent yeah on the property taxes that's from when we were down in this Capital last week, they did say that they're expecting less, you know, in the budget this year, but I don't know if that affects us. Or if that I mean, it can, depending on which, you know, shared revenue, right? Probably. Because we're getting, right, because we're getting shares, um, you know, of like the state's uh, fuel tax and things like that. So, there, yeah, there's certain things that, of course, are going to fluctuate somewhat, um, but we haven't gotten those in yet. We haven't gotten any indication of what those are going to be yet. I think, so. Kate, I think uh, Tina was supposed to put her budget out either yesterday or next Friday. I think she put it out yesterday. Yeah. Okay. I have. We should start there. So it's it's um it's not really going to be possible for us to a answer really specific questions about this coming year's fiscal year because we haven't built the budget yet. Um, 
Yeah, but we'll get into, we'll talk about high level about some things when we get into the context conversation about economic climate. So I'm going to talk about our outcomes because I'm going to, I'm going to guide you through what's in your agenda so that you know what to expect as we move through today. And I don't want to get too deep in the conversation yet because we haven't warmed up. So I don't know if there's any athletes in the room. So I take the same approach to retreats. Like we don't get into the content until we've had a little warm up exercise. We have our brains working. It's early. It's Saturday. Like we need to shift into that. So I have a little warm up exercise I want to do with you all. And then we'll roll the first days to get into the group. So uh, good questions. Save those. There's going to be an opportunity for those to all come forward. But let's start with the end in mind here. So. What we want to achieve by the end of the day today is have some refined goals that address current community needs, um, current council aspirations. You guys have some new folks on your team, which is exciting. And then also um, align with organizational capacity. So I say goal refinement versus like just goal setting because you're not starting from scratch. There's lots of stuff that's underway, um, things that are going to continue that are ongoing. So. We, we want to make sure that we're layering that stuff in as you also think about any new things that you want to work on. Um, the other thing that we want every year I get to work with a group, the, the process matures a bit. And so one of the things I heard in our, the interview conversations for those I got to speak with um, is that we want to make sure that we've got some really clear and measurable outcomes. And so I'm going to be <laughs> kind of just asking a lot of follow-up questions to really dig into what that looks like for the council. So um, I was in Eastern Oregon yesterday and they were like, we want, you know, we want better mobility. I'm like, how? Better mobility, like why? Like just, we're gonna, I wanna help you guys guide you towards what, how staff is going to actually measure that. So that when you come back and do this again, next year in two years, whatever cycle you're gonna land on, that you really have, uh, that can easily bring those progress updates forward so you know um, kind of what to expect and, and what that's going to look like. Um, so clear outcomes, accountability for the results, and then a strong partnership to advance the goals. So we're going to do some team building work. Part of that is we'll put, some of this will be a repeat for some of you, but I also feel like the talking about the governance, the roles and expectations is really grounding. It ties into why we do goal setting, how how these how this system of government works in a council manager form and um, and how staff and council really need to work together and stay in specific lanes in order for to produce the best outcomes. So we want to make sure we all have we're all coming from the same place on that and have a clear understanding of what that means. One thing that's unique to Skepus is we all should do a little orientation. So we have a few slides to also help you with some of the um, just rules, procedures, process type stuff. So. I have some slides. I think your city manager and your city attorney will also be trying to help um, explain some of those things and answer any questions. And so hopefully that will be a really helpful exercise to get you guys all on track to be able to have some efficient meetings. Because I know based on what I heard in the interviews, there's lots of stuff that you all want to do. And so uh, understanding the process and how that works is really important to your success. So with those goals in mind, what we have set up for the agenda today, as I mentioned, we're going to do a warm up. Um, and then we're going to talk about what we need to be successful in this work. So we'll set some guidelines for success. Then we'll shift into um, talking about the governance structure. So the rules, the expectations, and the orientation materials. We'll take a break at 1045. Then we'll get into uh, the environmental scan. And the environmental scan is it's thinking about where we currently are before you think about where you're going. So what that will include this year is talking about some of the accomplishments from 2022, um, some highlights from the goal updates. I know staff has been bringing you updates at the last couple meetings. When did you guys start in December? Oh, we got those in January. Start in January. So your January meetings, um, you received more detailed updates, but we're going to hit high level on just some of those highlights to refresh your memory because I know you get a lot thrown at you as a new elected official, so I want to make sure um, everybody has that in mind. We'll talk a little bit about the financial picture. As uh, Alex mentioned, you guys don't have a ton of specifics yet, but just really high level what things look like so that um, as you think about your goals, it's not really intended to be a buzzkill. That's what we called it yesterday. They're like, well, that's depressing. And But it's intended to just help you set realistic goals. There's no... There's no sense in like setting goals that they are completely unachievable. So it's good to have some things grounded in realism, some stretch goals for future years. So it's all okay. I don't want you guys to feel like you can't 
think big and broad for your community, but just know that it does, Alex and her team have to align that with whatever the fiscal reality is. So, um, so we'll talk a little bit high level about the financial piece, and then we'll have a conversation with the group about what other contextual factors do we need to consider? What other political factors, potentially unfunded mandates, things happening in the organization that need to be considered, things that you're hearing from the community as far as their needs. So we want to make sure we have this shared understanding of where we currently are before we map out wherever it is that we're going. Sound good? That's what the goal refinement. That's what the goal refinement will look like. Towards the end, I will help you shift into thinking about um, if you have those clear outcomes defined. Is are they are they actionable? Um, sometimes I'll hear stuff from councils like, well, we need to advocate for that. Okay, well, how do you measure advocacy? So I'm gonna, again, I'm going to challenge you to think about those things, like what should end up on your goal list versus what is just part of your goal. Um, and then if necessary, and if we're ready for it at this stage, we'll do some prioritization. Depending on where it lands, some groups aren't quite ready for that, and it might be a step two in council meeting or group survey. Um, but if we're able to get some real clarity today, we may be able to also do a prioritization exercise if, if the process calls for it. So we'll, we'll see um, how it unfolds. At the end, we'll leave some time to think about as a team what you all need to be successful in moving your goals forward. And then wrap it up, talk about some next steps, and then you guys will be on your way to doing a tour of this really wonderful approach. So is everybody on board with that? Okay, great. You guys ready to hear what this format was? All right. I had to ask Alex. I can use this a couple times, and I draw a lot, but I don't feel like I should be the one who has all the fun. I also purchased um, last week some new scented markers, so I'm just taking everybody back to their to their style of method. But uh, they're you can see can be a big fan, um, big fans of these. So lots of colors that you can choose from. And what you're going to do with these, I'm going to give everybody a sheet of flip chart paper. You will find a spot on the wall. Staff does this too. So, and you're going to draw yourself portrait. Um, I have seen all sorts of interpretations of this. Some people get really abstract. You can use words, you can use graphics. There's no like hard, fast rules. But a couple of things I want you to, um, to touch on in your portrait description is um, something that you're passionate about, um, the mindset that you're bringing to this work today. Something fun or interesting. This is the one people struggle with the most, which I think is hilarious, but something fun or interesting. It could be any fun fact you want to share about yourself. It could be something interesting that you've read, music that you love, a podcast you're listening to, uh, if there's something great you're streaming on TV, whatever that is. Uh, I also want to hear about what, what motivated you? What was your why to get involved in public service? So whether you're working at the city and serving the community or it's in the elected capacity, um, share what your why is for this. And then also what you need for courageous participation today. So courageous participation to me, it's about psychological safety. We want to create a safe media environment where there, there really aren't these stupid questions. You guys are coming at this. I appreciate the mayor kind of sharing this humility of I'm here, I'm trying to learn a lot. And it is like drinking from a fire hose when you're starting in these positions. And so we want to make sure that you feel safe to bring those questions forward, that people feel like they can bring forward questions forward without judgment. And um, and so what do you need for that, for courageous participation today? So you get to grab as many colors as you'd like. I'm going to pass around flip chart paper. You're going to find a place on the wall. You can use this whiteboard as well. I'll leave this up here on the side to center you for questions. Right. You're going to get about eight minutes to do your drawing, and then you can do a gallery walk and look uh, what you think of it. Yes, we're going to All right. I think we're drawing on the table. No, no, no. You guys don't have a public art program. You might need one after this. I'm sure we're going to see some real masterpieces <laughs> come forward. <laughs> yeah. 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 Nope. Okay, we got the last piece. So we don't get to do this. <laughs> no, no, no. 
Don't worry, I've got another board. Black board. Thank you. Oh, sorry about that. I'm here. Got one more sweet. Oh, you know? All right, let me grab the other pad. Oh, yeah. How many cheats are going to need two? Uh, Can you back here? Be back here? All right, I'm going to have work. Hi. I'm out of the stuff. Don't worry, we've got plenty. In this. One, and then maybe some tape. Right there. Is it tape? Who else still needs red? Okay. No, I have tape. You have you do? Oh, okay. All right. It doesn't seem fair to the rest of the group. It's not everybody has to. Participate. You want to talent? Yeah, I know you hear all sorts of hidden talent. Yeah. There's a couple of pieces of paper. Hey, me about that. Welcome. You guys might be in the students here. I'm scared of that. All right. Yeah. <laughs> 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 
How was I'm thinking probably over here. Oh, you're on your own with that. Uh, something like it could be family, it could be a, a professional hobby, it could be a duty, but just, uh, oh, that's personal, but personal. Yeah, personal passion for the family. Yeah. Are you done? <laughs> 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 they do hair. That's good. Yeah, love it. Uh, we are crazy about sure. Yeah. 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 Yeah, exactly. It's like, I know how this is going to go. Oh, yeah. Like the dress. Yeah. You, you sound like you're going right under the bed. Yeah. 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 I've read something. Amazing. Like, yeah, yeah. Look out. I love the talk. Yeah, let's All right. I'm in my own. Forget my bags. So you got a great one. Great on the curve on this. Great on the curve. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, there are no trees. All right. Maybe from the eye of the beholder. So. <laughs> Or like, being a psychologist, you know, they come in and turn like, like, it's a reverse matter. Uh, I get it. You need to go check in. You need to go first. Your is You're all on stage. <laughs> Okay, you guys go ahead and start. We're going to wrap it up. I don't understand.
Almost done. Um, uh, we're gonna do. We're gonna kind of like do a little gallery walk, so people can you can kind of stay where you are. You can join us while we kind of group around one. Or to go. Do we have any volunteers to go first? I was looking for a, I was looking for an open surface. Very presentation worthy. All right, guys, here, let me give you an example. So what I've learned in doing this exercise is that it can really consume like the entire morning because people really like to talk about themselves, surprisingly. So this is what it, this is what it sounds like when you're gonna go through your presentation. You wanna take about 90 seconds. So as much as you maybe wanna give us very detailed explanations about your life story, I'm gonna just challenge you to keep it to 90 seconds. So this is what it sounds like. Hi, my name is Sarah. My mindset today is um, that I'm bringing to this work is energy. I just hit my second trimester and I'm going to, and then come July, I'm going to have two kids under two, which is going to be nuts. So I'm soaking in the energy while I have it. Um, my passion is, is service. I love local government. I love the service that I get to provide to my clients. Um, I also love my family. I love my two Newfoundlands. I'm a big animal lover. Something fun and interesting. Um, I'm super excited that I'm a big Yellowstone fan, and I and I love like all the the other. I always get the dates wrong, but I think it's 18, um, 83. 83. Thank you. I always want to say 83, 83, and uh, 1923, which um, I think that's right. Anyway, it comes back on this weekend, so I'm just going to be excited for tomorrow. Um, what got me involved in public service is I've been doing this since I was in school and my first local government internship and I just I love the immediate difference you can see working in local government on the communities you serve and for courageous participation from my perspective today is I need to know what you all need so that I can help guide you on on this little journey we're on together today so about 90 seconds okay. all right who wants to start from the group any volunteers kind of do a gallery walk so you can stay where you are if you, if you can see if you'd like or you can kind of like gather around wherever we are in the room um, so you can admire these masterpieces that you've created. This is probably like really excited about these new markers. This is the most colorful display I've seen of this exercise in a while. So I feel like this oh, those empty markers are a secret to success here. Oh, now you're going to back with me. Oh, <laughs> yeah, Joe wants to go. You want to go? All right, Joe, pick us up. Kind of what you just kind of did? Yep, just what I just said. All right, my name is Joe. Um, I truly do feel that I bleed orange and black. I mean, I do it, it, being here for so long and especially being involved in athletics. Um, I feel that I did have two kids go to Oregon State and now I want to do a piece. I have a little bit of ball. But um, today I'm positive, encouraging, happy, uh, big smile. Um, I've really, over the last several years, have really decided to try to really be positive um, with the family, with the kids I'm coaching. Um, positive experience, um, especially for the kid. Um, my passions, I, I love, I do love to coach all sorts of various levels and, and um, athletics and, and mostly athletics, but other things as well. Really love the outdoor, my, my dad got me into that. So I love the hike, fish, hunt, camp with the family. Um, we do have a couple of puppies and dogs that um, I do really appreciate and love them too, as well as the cat. Um, I do reason I did get involved. I do love to give back. I, I, a long time ago, um, even back when Pete was uh, my mentor as a principal, I love to give back refing little kids basketball when I was a little kid. I always love to help out. I'm very passionate about Scat Boost and want to share that passion with others. 
And I felt that this role allows me to do that. Um, and I do want to see my kids and other kids in the area grow and thrive in scout groups. Because as I've coached them, like those kids have become my kids. And I want to see them do well here in scout groups. Give them opportunity to stay. I try to draw broad shoulders, like, you know, hop on a ball. But I'm not a drawer, you can tell that. Um, I've kind of started, and I don't know if it's my son, just started with improv and, and going to New York or going to Geeter and Comedy Club and trying to get up in front. But I've started to really love to be put in um, challenging, stressful positions and tries to help me grow and improve, not driving 100 miles an hour that, that could be an accident, but putting in situations that um, are challenging because, you know, it doesn't kill you, it makes you stronger. And, um, at this age, when there is a lot of stress in the world and stuff, I, I thought, you know, challenge yourself, put yourself out there. Um, I'm hoping today with honesty, co constructive criticisms, kind of a solution based approach, I think we can, I can get a, a lot out of this other than just kind of complaining and help me give some solutions, come up with some ideas other than just the problems. Okay. Um, that's me today. All right. Excellent. Thanks, Joe. Yeah. Great job. All right. We're going to move this way. Sorry. And so okay. Dave, you'll get to go fast. Okay. All right. So Tim, take it away. I am Tim. Um, so uh, I drew myself kind of with open arms because it's kind of, you know, I, when I enter into things, I really dive into them and I try to approach like with zeal and um, somewhat of a fearlessness, not a recklessness, but a fearlessness to try new things. Um, Today, my mindset is really opportunity, focusing on what we have the opportunity to create today, together as a team um, and for the, the community. Um, my passion is sustainability. I'm fortunate enough to be able to marry my passion and my career. Uh, so I'm a sustainability consultant. And what that means to me is ensuring that we can create systems that benefit environment, business, and people and uh, in a balanced system. Uh, and kind of a closed loop system, which is maybe why, weird fun fact, I'm mushroom crazy. <laughs> I love to forage for mushrooms. I've taken mushroom growing classes. I've got like eight different types of mushrooms growing in the house. And uh, I think the next class I'm going to take is uh, um, micro remediation, using mushrooms to remediate, um, you know, environmental problems uh, with land. Um, why I am here, or what motivated me into public service, is really the community. Uh, we've, we're going on five years here in the community, and uh, we've just fallen in love with it. And it, the opportunity to serve and give back is an honor, so I feel very honored to have this role. And today I am, uh, you know, I think uh, what I'm hoping for is just this honesty and openness so we can come to good solutions when it comes. All right. Thanks, Kim. Hey. Hello, everyone. Andrew over here. So I drew myself uh, in motion running because I'm a runner and have two kids under three. So they keep me uh, moving. Um, mindset, open mindset in every way possible. And that ties in with uh, this aspect. Really just excited about open collaboration. We all have different backgrounds we're bringing to the table. I'm um, excited to see how that all plays out. Um, both my jobs at the county and the university are all about public health, so I, I think that's kind of what what I bring and what uh, I'm excited to, to be part of as far as city council. And then a little uh, known fact, I grew up in Texas and I was the 1988 Wichita Falls Couch at Bingo champion. You don't know what that is. I'll have to figure it out, but it's a big deal. Uh, um, couch chip? Couch chip, bingo, yeah. Okay. So, <laughs> <laughs> Imagine a big, like, bingo grid in a pasture. I can imagine a pasture. Then, you know, imagine. Then, oh, then, pasture. Uh, cows. Okay. This is going to prompt yeah. a lot of good conversation. Yeah. Great. Okay. Can we have so, um, I did study art in college, but you wouldn't tell. But anyways, imagine it. Um, okay, so you guys can see it. So my mindset today is collaboration and thinking outside the box so we can be uh, creative. Uh, why public service? Uh, to represent my community and also to give my perspective. Um, uh, something, what? Something, oh, something fun. 
I used to teach kickboxing way back when. And so that was why I still love that. And also, what do I need um, for today? I need honesty, um, transparency, and of course, patience, since I'm also kind of learning. And um, my passion, I put in the heart business um, development. So that's or economic development. So um, I drew myself with a little cape. You can't tell. And I'm like, since I'm standing like this, I thought, why don't you have a little cape going on? But um, <laughs> so that's, that's me. <laughs> Okay, superhero status. Um, okay, Stephen. Well, long and hard about this, and it's probably the most embarrassing thing I've ever seen. <laughs> no, he's not. He's not Thank you for. Uh, but just that one. <laughs> back of the room means out of sight, out of mind. <laughs> no, trying to hide. Ah. Um, so, uh, my mindset. Open. Uh, being in law enforcement, we have to have an open mindset. So. I'm always open. Uh, passion has always been my family. Uh, ne never stopped. The reason I got into public service was for my family and community so that I could protect them. Um, the, to participation, I think kindness, because we're all going to have different um, mindsets, different uh, opinions, and it doesn't mean it's right or wrong, but we need to be kind to one another. And then uh, <clears throat> fun fact is um, growing up, I was afraid of heights. How do you conquer that? You get in the sky that So I love it. And then if I was not a police officer, I would be a fighter. Okay. I, I fight, I love MMA. Just happened that it came after um, I got old. So I couldn't do it. And uh, I think that's it. And now I can tear this down. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Steve, Steve, this is a supportive environment. I, you did great. If that's the most embarrassing thing you've ever done, oh my gosh, we should share some other stories. Okay. <laughs> uh, so, Chris, um, my mindset. Uh, my mindset is um, service to protect the public. Um, it's something that I've done in my career uh, in law enforcement, also I've served in the United States military, and it's something I really believe in. It's something I really find in this honor to be able to like that. People trust you, they should actually be able to do that. Sorry, my context. Um, why do you, what do you tend to, or why you got involved in some um, It really wants to help others. Um, just from my background, things such as that, you know, and uh, I really just thought that, you know, if I have the capability, instead of being a person who complains about stuff, I actually try to be part of the solution. So that's why I kind of got into uh, public service. So uh, my passion really is my wife and my son, uh, my little boy, Leon, a little five-year-old guy who, Really motivates me to do everything I can do and try to be the best person I can to follow every single day. Um, something fun. Yeah. Oh, something fun. I think it also with an open mind. Oh, yeah. Going back to the uh, courageous mind. Power. What do you mean? It's like doing an eye chest here. So. Yeah. <laughs> Not going so good. <laughs> <laughs> Just have an open mind. Now, a fun fact about me is I'm a big Ghostbuster fan. I used to own two purses for going to the Ecto One Ghostbuster. Cadillac for Kid Lucky, so that's it. All right, <laughs> that is that is a unique one. I've not heard it. Yeah. Okay, you didn't disappoint, Chris. Thank you. Uh, yeah, yeah, right. I'm like, uh, okay, Carol. Work. Okay. 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 I'm an accountant, okay? <laughs> so you have to think, uh, you know, think like an accountant. So, but, uh, it's funny. The, um, uh, but the what brought me to public service was kind of weird. Oh, first I've got to say this because I went to Oregon State and to Beaverton High. So I got to be a beaver for seven years and orange and black. So, uh, but, uh, you know, so anyway, but sorry, I'm a skeptic. I love it. Um, and I actually came here uh, because I actually came from the software company and I knew like, the finance director had left and um, I thought I could help with helping me to know what how the software works and maybe make things more efficient. That was that was my goal. So that's why I'm here. Okay. So um, my mindset, I've always been a teacher. You know, mm -hmm. that's, I'll tell anything anybody anything that I know, you know, as long as it's not personal or confidential. You know, that's uh, if you want to know something and I know it, I'll help you to figure out what's there. So um, and I know I can't tell you how much I've appreciated people because I came in really kind of from private industry 
and I think like a business person, I well, my master's in business, and um, I have really appreciated and I have the whole of my just so tell me anything, you know, criticize me, and I'm, that's the way I'm going to work. So I appreciate that. I do love gardening and cooking, but those are kind of my hobbies. So, so I don't always think about the cat. Um, <laughs> my garden digging in the dirt. Right? Yeah. <laughs> and I felt so good because Chris was struggling to read that. There's no chance I would read that. <laughs> so, yeah, good. thanks for raising that. So, anything I write up on the board, you guys are going to get a digital copy of that. So, like, if you can't see everything that I'm capturing, you guys are going to get the notes. So, it's all good. Okay. Thank you. And if we go into exercises and you're like, oh, I want to make sure I have that graphic, I encourage you these phones that we, these little mini computers in our pockets, they take the most amazing photos. <laughs> yeah, so grab a, grab a photo and you can zoom in and it's super helpful. All right, Lori. Oh, okay, I'll go next. So let's see, my set today is uh, it's about, for me, connection, connection, and connection, connection and learning and um, for us all seeking to understand, um, you know, everyone else's perspective. Uh, passion uh, for me is learning new things, uh, exploring and gardening. Um, let's see why I got involved. Uh, I love cities. I love thinking about how they function, how they can be made better, um, and just overall uh, wanting to make uh, the world a better place. <laughs> Um, so something fun. Um, I love house plants. I collect them. I only have 50. <laughs> Not that many. <laughs> um, let's see. I ride um, motorcycle on nice weekends with my husband around town, and we love it out in the hills. Um, what I need today is just, I think, what we all need, right? Respect and keep <laughs> understand one another, uh, open mind. Oh, that's what I got. All right. Thanks, Lori. Isaac. Uh, I'm Isaac. I'm here. My phone is mine. Today is public service. I'm always going to work. Uh, something fun. I'm a secret athlete. I worked at Catteries for like years. I have four, and it's not things like I think Catteries. Catteries, yeah. I went to Oregon Maine. I ran a. Oh, okay. Uh, for a while. Okay. Yeah, love uh, my passions are my family and my hearing business. Um, Today, I think we just need to remember that we're all here to serve the same public, we're on the same team. And I got involved to create better outcomes for the public, um, reduce waste, make things better. Awesome. Thanks, Matthew. <laughs> Peter. I'm Peter, and my art ability really hasn't progressed since elementary school. Um, <laughs> my mindset is learning and providing information, and part of that is learning how you guys receive information and how it can affect. Because every city council is different. Um, I need clear direction. That's what I always need um, is to know what outcome you guys want. And if that's an outcome that we can achieve, sometimes it is and sometimes it isn't. Um, I first uh, got involved representing cities because there was a city that was getting sued all the time and losing. And it kind of offended my sensibilities as far as fair play. So I began representing them and they haven't been sued in five years, so um, that was good. I really enjoy winning uh, more than <laughs> more than most people. My former law firm did this personality testing on us, and it came back that uh, I really enjoyed winning. So. <laughs> um, fun fact: I was made fun of by Don Rick. <laughs> <laughs> Is that the stomach right there? I mean, what's all that? It's that I was starting to put, I was starting to, I was starting to write down, and then I just said something. I crossed it out. All right. I will, yeah, so make sure note yourself, like, don't play Peter in my any. <laughs> Holy moly, yeah. Alex. Jeez. Probably going to kick your butt. Okay. All right. Alex. Um, so, where are we starting here? Um, Okay, so for passion, I put family, art, and skiing. Um, for an interesting fact, my great great grandmother's in the Calgary Hall of Fame, and actually, the ranch that her and her husband managed is referenced in Yellowstone many times. Oh, it's that's still fun. It's, it's in Texas. It's a lot of pitchfork. Um, Oops. Let's see. Um, for let's see, mindset, I'm just looking forward to hearing 
capital school so I can start planning for the next fiscal year. I don't know why, but I like planning for things. It kind of like works well in this job. So um, I'm just really curious to get that kind of input so I can start building the budget and really putting things together. Um, as far as why I got involved in public service, um, you know, I, I like having work that's really meaningful. And I think this is work you can reach when you have to see it. Um, and then I also, I was always interested in governance, but I never wanted to run for office. So sorry, I left this. I'm glad you are. I'm glad you do, but I don't want to. <laughs> um, let's see. And then I think what I need, um, I mean, I think it's similar to what we talked about, but I think sometimes as the implementing side of things, um, sometimes we have to bring information to council that isn't really what you wanted to hear. And that there's this benefit of the doubt that it's not about us trying to put up roadblocks or stop what you want to do. It's really about us trying to be honest about what we think is possible. And I think sometimes um, that there can be this sense that, you know, we're working against you or we're not a team and that's not it at all. We want you to be successful. We don't want to over promise something we can't deliver. And so I think it's really important for us as the people on the implementing side to be as kind of realistic as possible while you're doing the big visioning and big ideas that we have to bring those down to earth and make it actionable. And so sometimes when those don't align, um, it can be tough for us, I think, to deliver you bad news. And so um, just to be open that give us the benefit of the doubt that's not coming from a negative place. We're just trying to make sure that we can actually do as much as we can as, as we can all. So, all right. Thanks, Alex. Yeah. Okay, uh, Tyler. All right, mine is uh, the grade scale version of I think everyone else is. Uh, <laughs> my name is Tyler, and I took on the uh, mindset, I took more of an approach of. Um, my general mindset or rather than my mindset today but my mindset today is basically to um just uh make things better for the city um plan uh how we're going to make the city better through uh, constructive dialogue and then i sorry i should have started over here but i'm going to go a different route here um my passion i forgot to put but my passion is um public service i've been um in public service since the age of 14 in some capacity um why I got involved in public service? I like to make things better. Um, that's just a general core, um, I would say, uh, value or principle of mine is that I, uh, my brain never turns off on how I can make things better. And that's also what I think has made me very successful in the software industry too, is because I'm always looking for ways to improve uh, the service that I deliver to my clients. Um, what I mean for uh, courageous participation, uh, <laughs> again, this goes back to my general mindset, a problem to solve. If I have a problem um, that needs to be solved, my brain doesn't turn off. I literally think in my sleep and wake up with ideas in the morning. It's rather annoying. Um, let's see here, something fun, interesting. Uh, working makes me happy. So um, I am usually always found in front of my computer and it's actually what makes me happy. Um, my dogs make me happy too. I have a very, uh, Outgoing and uh, I call him a child with special needs Doberman. So if anybody has ever had a Doberman, they definitely know what I'm talking about. And then uh, we also like to go to one time. But most of you already know that about me. Thank you. All right, thanks, Tyler. Actually, um, can I add one thing? This sure. isn't. I'm gonna go out on a limb here. Um, I actually want to throw in my pet peeve. My pet peeve of mine is um, lack of follow through. Um, anybody who says something that they're gonna do something and they don't follow through. Um, or they uh, don't communicate about where they're at with things. Uh, that's one of my pet peeves. Thank you. All right. So, Good okay. Pete. I'm going to the mindset. I'm eager uh, and involved in public service because uh, I love Scapoose. I love our community. I love our schools. I love uh, people here. And uh, I've always done it. It's just who I am. Uh, the, uh, I think what I need to be creative is. Uh, is to work in an environment that's not real judgmental and I'm talking to myself when I say that as well as others and and to be in an environment that's inclusive and that I feel comfortable. I'm sure everybody has the same same needs. Uh, my passion is my family uh, and as far as interesting things, I uh, play tennis, uh, not as well as I used to, but I still play. Uh, I love to travel and uh, interesting fact, I'm related to Gypsy Rose Lee. Oh. Anybody know who she is? No. Oh my goodness. Who knows who she is? Oh my goodness. I here knows who Gypsy Rose Lee is? Your family member. Uh, well, you <laughs> <think I'm... laughs> 
She's a famous, some people would call her a stripper, but she was really a burlesque dancer, yeah. an actress, and a uh, singer. Yeah. So, <laughs> cut, cut the after, yeah, the so maybe, yeah, yeah, dance skills. Maybe next next time we'll have to think of a different format. Maybe you guys some dance skills. So. Okay. I knew. I just didn't know how to communicate. Okay. What? <laughs> <laughs> so like, I thought Dave's laugh, Megan's laugh, but Dave, go ahead, take it away. Yeah. Okay. So my name is Dave. Hopefully, I kind of followed that. I, I think I did to some degree. Um, the biggest reason, though, that I took this job is for the challenge of it. I wanted to bring my experience from the private sector to this community to help improvement. And, you know, I'm driven and optimistic with every project that comes before us so we can get through it. There's nothing too big that this group can't take on and accomplish in the end of it. So that's kind of my passion there with that. Um, as far as the, the courageous participation, I think you need to have some confidence in yourself to speak up. I think that if you don't participate, if you're the person who's shy about it or don't want to engage, you're going to miss out. When you leave, whatever that, like today, if there's something unspoken, you're going to have regrets that you didn't say it because you may not get the closure that you want to it. Um, as far as myself, um, I'm very passionate about my family and my children. I like to tinker around with classic cars, and at the age of 50, I decided to take up music. It's never too late, so I've been learning how to play drums every evening in my house. My wife loves that. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm a guitar. So that's me. Okay, Megan. Yeah, peppermint patty is pretty much what it looks like. <laughs> and, um, at the heart of me is just family and teaching. I'm just obsessed with children and youth and my own and everybody else's. And that is why I had to leave the classroom because I gave everything to everybody else's children during the day and I just didn't have enough for my own. And I'm learning to find the balance now that they're getting back into school and I'm substituting and I think that when I do go back full time, I will know how to tackle those emotions of being a mom to 28 during the day and then being a mom to three at night. Um, I got into this because I love to teach, educate and connect others. Um, I'm also, you know, like the, the president of the PTA, et cetera. I just think that, you know, when you have resources or you know who can go where, I don't have to be the one that is that person, but I can connect people to where they need to go. Um, I just always need to have an open mind and act with humility. And I ask that of everybody in the room as well. Um, I'm on the equity, diversity, and inclusion committee for the school district. And I think that that's something that I've really experienced over the last few years is everybody comes with their own story and making sure you're, you're listening to hear, not always to speak. Um, my mindset is a growth mindset. There's always room for growth. I think we teach that in the school, um, you know, and being a teacher, you're a lifelong learner. And I love to reflect back and think how I could always do better. And then um, I don't really know. I can do weird things with my elbows and who knows what. But I just did a. I just did. A, I'm a farm girl. You know, I love to you know bucket and back up a trailer, and um, I love to dribble that ball down the court. So kind of a basketball nerd, right? Thanks, Megan. Yeah. Thanks, everybody. Those were great. You guys, everybody's like, oh, I don't have any art skills, and I. Right. Seen plenty of fantastic skills around the room. And the best part is the stories that you all shared. A couple of reasons why we do this. This is not just, it's certainly not to embarrass anybody or try to make you feel uncomfortable, but it's an opportunity to connect with one another. So a lot of the personal stuff that you guys heard, I encourage you to carry that into your breaks. Ask questions, learn more about Gypsy Rose Lee. I mean, whatever, <laughs> whatever it might be. But um, what I've got is important is that sometimes when you're in that meeting environment and like dissent comes up or disagreement or conflict, like having those personal connections with people make those moments a lot easier to navigate. And so that's why it's important to build a team, to get to know one another and, and to generate that extra, those relationships and that respect that comes with it, because it certainly just makes the tough times a little bit easier. All right. Um, one last thing that we need to do to get started. And you guys talked a lot about this, and then I asked you what we needed for greatest participation. So this, this could go fairly quickly. But we need to set up some rules for success for today. And so, what do we need to be successful in our conversations and to be able to get through this agenda? Anybody want to share some highlights that you heard in the conversations or whatever you'd like to add? Like popcorn out? Yeah. 
open mind. I see in a row said open. So. I, I think we need constructive dialogue. I think that, um, you know, oftentimes people have things on their mind that they may be afraid uh, to, to say them. Um, I think this this is the chance. This is where we need everybody to collaborate and speak what's on their mind. So this is the opportunity to do that. Yeah, this is I'm glad you raised that, Tyler. It is this unique meeting experience that you have where you really get to have that dialogue. It does. That's not always the case at the diets. Like there's you might have big agendas or work sessions are time limited. And so this is an opportunity to really have some rich dialogue. So to take advantage of that. What else do we need? I think patience and respect. What does respect mean to you, Chad? Respect that, um, uh, you know, everybody has their own opinion, their own ideas. And when you, uh, somebody mentioned constructive um, criticism, to be open to that. But in, in but all, you, have, you know, we have to be respectful of each other's and, and our different, um, you might not agree, but we have to be open to it. Yeah, it's okay to disagree. We, in fact, we, we need that. So that's what helps us get towards more innovative solutions, but to do it in a way that feels respectful and safe. I kind of feel that um, it's nothing personal and we all are here for the same purpose and same reason. We're all here to, for a better scaffold. Yeah, so sometimes we talk about this as, you know, assuming good intent. And you guys touched on that. That's why I asked that question about what motivated you. I didn't hear anybody's motivations have like any sociopathic undertone, but like you all mentioned that you really have this community that's interested at heart, that you love service, that there's just, I, I loved hearing stories about what inspired you. So, Sometimes that stuff gets lost when we disagree. So yeah, so no, it's not personal and we can keep, keep our um, community intent in mind. What else? All right, that's going to set us up for success. I think we should also consider thinking sometimes outside the box, be creative. Okay. Just because something has been done um, the same, does it mean it's the right way or open to different ideas? Yeah, I think uh, you guys have a lot of new folks on this team. And so I would expect that some of that would come forth. What else? One that I always add, and um, hopefully you guys are okay with this, is that as we get towards the end and the goal setting process, this is really more for council, but I'll be checking in with you all. If there's ideas that come up and not everybody agrees with it, we'll check for a majority or consensus, and that's how stuff moves forward. Are you okay with that? Otherwise, what can happen is you end up with these one-off ideas, and if the council doesn't support it, we don't want to send staff down that path of like wasting resources on something that ultimately is not going to move forward. So. Um, the goals move forward with consensus or majority. Is that a good practice too? Because in council meetings, you want to do the same thing. I mean, if there is a vote and it passes, it's time to move on. To, you don't necessarily agree it's four or three and time to move on to the next thing. And yeah, and that's really hard. I, I will just tell you, I, it's not one of my favorite roles to enforce as a facilitator, but it's absolutely necessary. So we're not like taking votes in this room, but what that will look like if we come to those, we come to those moments is I'll look for like a show of hands or, you know, I will check in with you and you know, there's like a head nod, a yes or no, like I can support that moving forward. Um, but it's really important and I, you know, I'll be, I'll try to be very consistent about how I do it. Um, if I get a general consensus from the group that you guys support something, I'm not going to do the check-in, but if, if there's any ambiguity about it, that's where I'll, that's what will prompt that. So just know, and so that if it's your idea that doesn't move forward, it's not personal. It's just, it's important for the success of the group. Okay, anything else? Um, I just want to note that in our council, 
team agreement on the last page. It's the last page of the whole booklet. It says individual council member conduct agreements. And number 10 says move on as a team after the decision has been made, support each other even if we don't agree. And then it, it just stops there and you move on. So that is something that I, I think we will review today, but it's already been in our on our desk. So maybe we can just honor the your council rules. We're going to talk about that specifically and then add it up here. Anything else? All right, um, just one more thing. We don't have to write it up there, but just one more thing that I'll emphasize is no, uh, just no side conversations. Not only is it going to be frustrating for the recording aspects, but it's really hard for me as a facilitator to hear you and to, or to hear whoever's speaking if there's stuff going on on the sidelines. That's a really, well, there's some educators in the room, but I really have to flow into teacher mode and like silence that. So. Happens. But teachers can be the worst students. <laughs> I know. I've witnessed that. Lots of educators on these councils. So just know I'm prepared to do this. Right? <laughs> okay. Let's talk about um, the council, the governance overview. I've been talking so much about governance lately. I'm helping with Beaverton's. You know, Beaverton recently transitioned to this council manager form of government. So we've been doing governance training and like I think cities take for granted that you have all of these like council meetings and policies and procedures in place. Granted, they have some, but they are really like starting from scratch. And it's just been some really interesting conversations. But this framework has been really helpful to just simplify it and break it down. Some of you have seen this before. And so um, I'm going to run through these and I have a couple more to add up there. But um, talking about what the council manager form of government is. There's, you have the policy side of this, which is council, and you have the administration side of this, which is staff. This is a system. There's lots of systems in which we operate. So government has systems, we have education systems, um, environmental systems. And so it's really important in order to be effective in the system to understand what it is and how it works. And in this system, it's where I've seen it be most successful is that people understand their roles and stay in their lanes. Um, and it, and it, it really works as a partnership. So let's talk about what those lanes are. Um, policy on the council side, you guys set the what. And on the staff side, staff determines the how. This is really important in goal setting. We're going to get into this today. It's like you guys are going to want to talk about projects and really specific tasks. And while those things help us to understand the outcomes that you want to drive towards, that's really the work of staff. You know, and from council, you guys are setting the policy direction. And so really trying to like challenge yourself to think at that higher level. Staff on their side, they take that direction that you give and they provide the how. Alex was really articulate in explaining, like she wants to build the budget and put the services and programs together that are going to help you achieve the things that you want to achieve. And, and she has to do that in a realistic way um, that, you know, you guys don't have on, I don't know if Scathlis has a magic pot of money somewhere, but you're, you know, cities are pretty uh, resource constrained. And so we have to, we have to figure out what's realistic with what, it, you know, based on what you want to do. Um, so staff determines the how. On this side, the equation, council, you guys are elected by your community. So you represent the constituents. And the most important piece of that is you keep staff informed. So you have your thumb on the pulse of the community. You know what people are saying. You know what's going on. And so making sure that you're sharing that with your um, with your staff is really important because it impacts policy. Staff, well, some of them may live here. Maybe not all of them do. But what they bring to the table is they provide that professional and technical expertise. I heard a couple people cite just years of experience or advanced degrees that they hold. Local government employees have never been more specialized than they are today. They bring so much knowledge into this role and council really has to trust and, and depend on that knowledge and expertise. There's no way that it, as elected officials, you can know all, all of those things. You certainly, they provide you, um, I'm sure, very exciting and exhilarating staff reports to read. Uh, so it gives you the overview of that stuff. 
but they if you have questions about those things you need to bring those forward so that staff can make sure you have the information that you need to create good policy so the third piece of this what we're doing today is the council sets the goals the priorities and the direction so you guys provide the direction and then staff takes that direction and aligns it um, with the resources to get it done. Um, so that's how you know, that's going to be the building of the budget and the work plans that they put together for the departments. And then the last piece is I don't know that council always thinks about this as a policy decision that they're making, but you guys approve the budget and contracts. And that decision, that budget decision, is that is one of the most important decisions, policy decisions we make all year. And then staff has the responsibility of carrying out those projects and programs. So um, it can be really tempting sometimes for staff to have opinions and want to like influence the policy side, but they need to stay in their lane. And I find with council, it can also be very tempting um, based on whatever your professional background is to get into the weeds of wanting to administer stuff or to tinker with like employees or like you get into the personnel stuff and like that is not that's not what you signed up for when you signed up for this role not in the system of government city of portland different story <laughs> <laughs> different form of government well not for long but um and the council manager form of government these are the roles so with these roles comes some expectations so let's talk about those now this is where the quiz comes in some of you have seen this before but uh, it's a little bit different in every city because we i have this is the interactive part so what do we what do we expect from council on the council side in the system you who have done this should know these answers i think they expect me to read what they give me yes back and, oh. and be informed <laughs> it's hard, but you have to be prepared. Yeah. yeah, that is definitely an expectation. So not only be prepared, but be prepared and ask ask questions if it's not clear. I know it's a heavy lift to read all that stuff, but that is, I mean, that's actually a summary of like the information that comes forward. And if the staff reports are hard to decipher, then you need to have a conversation with your team about how maybe how to make it easier, more digestible, how you're gonna debrief the staff to understand what's in there. But it's also really important to ask those questions in advance. But so the, the gotcha moments in council meetings, I have never, not that it doesn't come up occasionally, but that is not a very effective tactic for this, for this partnership to work. Nobody wants to be embarrassed. And staff, as you've heard, they want to provide you with the information they need. So be prepared and ask good questions. What else do we expect of council? Megan? Go to meetings. <laughs> yes, attendance is important. No, I love, I, yeah, I would like that on there. Thank you. Uh, some of you mentioned in your conversations of just like it's an honor to serve and yeah you can't serve you're not there to make the decisions if you don't show up what else do we expect talk with the community interact with citizens so yeah that we can have a pulse on yeah so engage with the community And follow up. Tyler talked about uh, so, you know, uh, follow up. I expect when we do ask something that something is done, we do get resolution. So that's kind of an expectation on the staff side of like give good direction. So what I would say on the how that manifests on the council side and direction is make decisions. You guys have to make decisions. So you're going to do all these other things, and that's important. But at the end of the day, you have to make a decision, and sometimes that's really hard. 
What happens if we don't make decisions? Nothing gets done. Nothing gets done. Staff, what else happens? Yeah, left, left left directly. Yeah, we don't well, we don't have clear direction, and so we're often left not knowing what what you all as a group want. And then sometimes too, I think it creates confusion because I think sometimes there's actually different expectations coming from different members of council when there's not clear direction. Yeah, so on the staff thing, so on the staff side, we are on council make decisions. The other way I've seen this manifest is if you don't make decisions, it also has morale impacts on the organization. I had, I've been doing these retreats since the first week in January. So I do like three a week at this point. I have one staff member tell me, I like working in this city because our goals get funded and stuff gets done. That's motivating. If, if stuff's not getting done, if decisions aren't getting made, you can have a real morale problem in your organization. And people are resources. You have turnover that's being created by that. That is very expensive and not a very good use of city resources. So on this side, make decisions. And then as um, Joe mentioned on this side, uh, accountability to get things done. So staff have clear direction. They can, they can get things done. Make decisions the same as task, you know, task staff. Um, give them tasks, clearly defined tasks. That yeah, it's make I think it's make decisions and probably that clear direction. I th honestly, I think that make decisions, you've already given us the direction. And so we're bringing it back to you and saying, OK, here are the results. What do you want to do next? And sometimes I can I know it's challenging, but that's sometimes where we get, I think, a little bit caught up and maybe a decision isn't made. Um, and the, you know, there's not as much clarity. Um, so I think there's part of that. And then also just in general, too, um, and, and not that I've experienced this with this council, but even though, you know, in this form of government, the staff work for the city manager, um, you know, their experience with council members and their experience in council meetings is very much a huge part of um, their working environment. And so, yeah, if, if there are gotcha moments or, or odd things that happen where they feel demoralized in meetings, that can absolutely drive turnover and make people want to leave. Uh, so making decisions, clear direction. We're going to get some, some of the other staff ones in a moment. One other, oh yeah, Tyler. Else. This is on the left side there. Um, so one thing that I've witnessed to at council meetings is it doesn't come up a lot, but we'll get into two discussions on things in front of us and um, it will evolve. And then by the time we're done talking about it, though, and I go back and think, OK, well, what's staff going to do with this? I don't think that we have set clear expectations or clear direction for them. And so I think it's just a matter of um, keeping in mind when we do get in these discussions uh, during council meetings, too, that we look at it and say, OK, if I was in staff's position, would I have um, clear direction on what I need to deliver? And that's not always the case. I don't think we do that a lot, but I do notice that we do that sometimes. But I mean, I, I would feel a little lost about what I'm supposed to do with staff. Yeah, and so I, I think staff has a responsibility to kind of check back in to make sure they heard it right before mm -hmm. moving forward. Then. And they, they do. Yeah, and I feel like at yeah. the end of some of those discussions that do get maybe go longer and wander a bit that I do try to bring it back and make clear what it is we're bringing back um, for to further the conversation. But yeah, sometimes it is a little confusing. Yeah, so so just a, a point to add in there for council is to, to reflect and confirm for yourself that like is what we're sharing providing clear direction and if not speak up to make sure that that's the case. A couple important ones you guys haven't touched on yet. Um, Ming kind of touched on it over here, but um, acting as a body. What does it mean to act as a body? Council, your authority in your charter, which we'll talk about in the next piece of the presentation, but the authority with this body, the authority for making decisions lies with the body, not with you as individuals. So what does it mean to act as a body? I need to not, or we, sorry, I'm just talking. Um, we need to, I mean, we represent the city. We work as a as one team as a council, so we're not pinning each other against each other or trying to, you know, work that majority vote prior to meetings and cooperating. You know, like yeah, that's a legal sure. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but also like an us versus them amongst each other on council. That um, I don't know how to put it into words, but that. 
I, I, I don't know. I don't know how to. Yeah, it's it. kind of it's about respecting the authority as a body. And yeah. How I've seen this play out is if you're in the minority part of the decision, if you're in the minority vote of the decision, and you didn't get what you were advocating for, after the vote's been made and the the decision stands, going out here is a prime example that I've seen get people into a lot of trouble. Is going out on social media and blasting the decision that the body just made because you didn't agree with it. Not that you can't have an individual opinion about it, but what it would look like in a one body perspective is like tonight the council made a really tough decision about X, Y, or Z. And while I didn't vote for this decision, I support the direction of the city and this is how we're moving forward. That's acting as a body. Blasting it and being negative about it and talking negative, talking in a negative way about it, whether on any platform, is undermining the authority of the body. What happens is it makes you guys look dysfunctional as a group and it does not build community trust. And in order for, so while we talk about the partnership here, the piece of this that we could also probably draw another circle is like you also need the, the trust of the community to get any of this work done. So if you're acting like a dysfunctional family at the dais, like that's not going to bode well for community trust. So just keep that in mind. I just, you know, not to like lecture you about it, but I've seen that really get teams going sideways and they get frustrated at the end of the year when their goals have to move forward as they hope they will, but it's because they're not respecting the goals here and acting as a body. Okay, the last one here is um, partnering with staff. Again, it's a partnership. So communicate what you need, bring forth those communications and also respect the communication protocol. So I forget what's in your council goals, but all, all Communication goes through the city manager here. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. Why is that important, Alex? I could tell you guys why it's important. But maybe... um, I think it can create a lot of um, confusion and issues if if st individual staff members think they're being directed by a single counselor. Um, you know, the members of staff don't work for council. I do. Um, and also, too, depending on the number of hours that goes into whatever the requ request is, that may need to go back to council for a majority vote. Um, it, it's very specific in the code that if something's going to take more than a couple hours, an individual request from a counselor, that I refer that back to council for a vote so that you all are directing staff um, as a body. And um, and in general, too, we also outline in the, the code that we, as much as possible, really prefer to be directed in council meetings so that it's very clear to everyone what it is that's being requested. Um, so it just it creates some confusion um, and it can be really challenging if, st if staff members put on the spot. Um, so and, and not that again, I'm not really seeing that with this group, but it can create problems. Yeah, it's, and it's easy. It's like an easy thing to slip into because right. you have a question. You're like, oh, I got the chief's email. I'm just going to email him my question, or I'm gonna email the sergeant my question because I saw him on the street, or you might see somebody at the grocery store or whatever the case may be. You have to remember as elected officials that even though you're just like normal people, there's a power dynamic between you and the staff and, and that can get really confusing. So that's why um, they pay Alex the big bucks to have all of these bosses versus like in a staff situation, that would be really unfair. They don't have all of these bosses, they have a boss. So from a performance management perspective, it is really confusing and hard to track performance if you've got, you know, if the staff person is not reporting to the appropriate supervisor. So it just creates chaos in the organization. It's not a good practice. Um, follow the communication protocols. It makes everything work much better. And it allows for Alex, if she's getting questions from one part of the council, if that it, it, it can highlight that, oh, we need to share this information with the rest of the council to make sure that everybody's got the same stuff. And I've generally found that this group does really well with that. Yeah. Uh, like they'll they'll call me up and say, "Hey, I'd like to reach out to so and so," and then they'll see see me when they do or something like yeah. that. So I'm not I'm not seeing a big issue here. Um, it's just it's just yeah. best practice. Good, good practice. Yeah. Tyler. So I don't know if now is the time for <clears throat> this conversation, but one of the things that I struggle with is how do we evaluate as counselors the performance of the cities and the different departments based on what we're hearing and observing. So from the community, we're seeing, we see all of these different, all the different feedback from the community. Most recently, it's police department. That's a big issue. So one of the things that I struggle with is how do we accurately and fairly gauge the city manager's performance? Because we can't, like we're talking about here, 
we don't direct staff. We don't direct the police chief. We don't have those types of conversations with department heads. So in your experience, what is the way that we as city council gauge the performance of the city manager based on what we're hearing downstream? I think it's about, and I don't know how, I have no idea how Alex's evaluation practice currently works, but I know that there's lots of different methods and practices used for evaluating a city manager. But I think, first of all, it's providing really clear goals and direction. That's part of this, the measurable outcomes, um, so that it's clear how she's being evaluated. And then it's sometimes it folks use consultants to help guide, guide you through those. Um, evaluation processes, but some, I mean, in the instance of public safety, like that's a, that's a tough, I know that's one that you guys have struggled with. I think I heard about it in all of your interviews. And um, I think setting clear goals for what you want to see happen first with public safety and, and making sure that it's reasonable. I mean, she's, Alex is a, a city manager, she's not a magician. And it's like, you have to make sure it's, you're not going to wave a magic wand and get all of the results in one year. So, so, just being, so just making sure it's feasible and realistic for the time period and, you know, whatever the expectation is. So that's kind of my point is, you know, as council in our form of government, that's why I'm bringing it up right now because we're talking about our form of government. We don't have, I don't feel that we have the clarity to be able to know one way or the other. And so that is really um, frustrating for me because I feel like I'm in a spot where I can't adequately have an opinion either way because we just don't have enough information. Because if we stay in our, our lane, we don't have these other details about what exactly is going on downstream. So we don't, we don't have the information to make a fair uh, assessment of where the problem is or if there is a problem. Uh, but we just, this poses a big problem in, in my opinion, because I mean, it's great in one way, but the big problem is, is we don't have the clarity about what's going on downstream. And so it makes it really difficult to understand if a city manager is performing the way that we expect or not, because we don't, we don't have the fair details. We don't have all the information. So my question is to you. Is, is there anything that comes up in your mind that bridges that gap on how we get the information that we need? If we don't, if we don't know what's going on in the planning department or who's, you know, um, if employees are leaving in masses or whatever. Sometimes some people use like the, so if, if you're seeing issues in the organization and people are leaving in mass, like sometimes it's a 360 review process where you're getting some direct feedback from the various departments. I've seen that groups use that as a tactic. And this actually just came up in Forest Grove. So they're, they've got HR pulling together a little analysis of some different evaluation practices because they haven't updated it in a long time. And so that's certainly something that as a council you guys could explore as there are, there are different techniques and ways to go about it. I do think some organizations are one, limited by the data that they collect. So being clear about what data expectations that you have, because it may exist and it may not. And if it doesn't exist, we have to think about, okay, well, how would you inform that? The other thing is in setting goals and um, in expectations for a manager, making sure that you've got a budget that supports that. I mean, you're not setting up anybody for success if they don't have the resources that they need to actually implement the things they're talking about. So. I think it, based on your questions, you know, it might be helpful for you to, to check out what's happening in a few other cities and some of the evaluation methods that are used. Can I kind of ask Tyler, are you asking something like uh, we get a planning update uh, to get a, an update on every department? So then you'll feel like you're more informed or? We do. Um, we do. Um, but a plan, but a police department. We do. We get a we department do. report packet every meeting. I know we get the, the planning is that it's that we're talking about flipping through and it's all the department. So, okay. department. Mm -hmm. so is that what you're talking about? And then having that conversation for me, and it's, I was going to bring this up for me sometimes because I came in the middle of last year to me, it was, um, for me, it was trying to get the history behind everything. And so for me, it was like, okay, do I, do I take time away from the staff, which they're already limited on their time, to say, hey, sit down, give me a little bit of history? Yes. Um, and let's, I want to just create some protocols, like let Jeanette finish her question, and then we can try and then. Exactly. So thank you. And so that's kind of, you know, should what to do, what not to do. And so as new yeah. council people, that was my, yeah, I think my frustration a little bit last coming to it. 
best here? Yeah, I think it's hard. You're, today you're going to get some orientation. I think I hope that helps to provide some clarity. I, again, I think asking staff for additional information. Again, you guys have a small team, so keep that in mind. Like, if you want the history, uh, depending how far back. I mean, you kind of have to be specific with your your questions, and then also think about. I feel like so because we have access to a lot of data these days. Everybody's like, I want all the data, but why? Help help people understand the why you need the data, or or what it is that you're trying to drive towards. Because what you're asking for. It might not be the data that you actually want. There might be a data set that serves that better that can be extracted, or there may just be an easier way to answer that question so that you're not having to sift through all of this data and have it be really time consuming. So making sure that you're explaining, here's my question, here's why I'm asking it, this is what I'm trying to get at. And same thing when you think about the data that you need to evaluate a certain thing, it's like, what's the what's motivating that? Again, this gets into when you do strategic planning and setting goals and setting indicators. People are like, we need to gather all this data. It's like, well, that is super time consuming and expensive to do all that analysis. And I've yet to see a local government adequately resourced to be able to do that level of analysis. Lots of great technology there. But if folks can be clear about why they need that data and the purpose that it's serving, um, that can really help bring some clarity. And just sometimes like I'm like a visual or an uh, an audio learner and sometimes having a conversation, I can process it better yes. than just a reading it off of bullet points. So that's why I just didn't want to give the staff more work than you know than they need to. So that was my hesitation. Yeah. So I think where I've seen it be most productive, outlining your questions, being able to articulate the why, doing that in advance, because again, if you've got an hour allocated with Alex, let's make sure you're setting it up, both of you up for success and making the best use of everybody's time to have that framework in front of you before you launch into that conversation. Okay, if you can send it to her in advance beforehand, even better. So, and if the reports that are currently coming forward, those updates, you know, if that's not the most effective way, then you need to share that with your team because that stuff takes a lot of time to put it together and like if that's not the best way to share updates, then you need to share that with Alex so your team's not wasting time. All right, are we ready to get into, oh no, we're not, because we gotta finish the staff expectations. Okay, so oh, we talked a lot about what we expect from the council. So what do we expect of staff? We already talked about one being like getting things done. And part of this is um, it's supporting a high performing organization. What else do we expect? Uh, communication. I I don't want to hear things that are happening in the city that are significant from community members and other people before I hear it from our city manager. Yeah, that's a great point, Tyler. I have yet to meet an elected official that likes surprises. So communication, no surprises. It's not always unavoidable. I think you know sometimes the flow of communication can happen so fast these days. Being reasonable with these expectations, but as much as possible this communication and this partnership, and it works on this side too. Um, the gotcha moments in council with that communication, that's not really particularly effective either. So no surprises on this side either. Um, what else? Does that communication include staff reports? So we're getting reports regularly from them to see yeah, what Yeah, I think that really gets into the staff providing. It's a little bit different. That's that technical and professional expertise. They should, staff should be bringing that forward. So, um, I think that's a, a primary expectation. So provide professional and technical expertise. The other piece that ties into this is uh, neutral advice. So it can be really hard to be un unbiased. It's not that staff doesn't have opinions, but when they're bringing that information forward, um, to make sure that they're doing it in the most unbiased way possible and providing you with all of the options to consider. What else? What, any other expectations? Sorry, council. Is it up there to be available and to respond to emails to get back in a timely manner? Yes. Yeah. So I think this that's definitely part of this is not only communication, but timely communication. 
you. Because over I there you said possible. you ask questions on our expectations, but I need to be able to get an answer back. Yes. And I think as much as you can, articulating the expectations around, you know, when you need it by, um, just so that can help staff prioritize the requests that come through. It can be a lot sometimes. Anything else? I, I guess I, patience, I guess, um, ask patience for. Yeah. I think, that's, her. I think that's one that, you know, on both sides here, especially when you've got a lot of new folks on the council, it's just patience on both sides as people learn and figure stuff out. I mean, you guys are all constantly learning, but when you're brand new to the role, having having some patience and letting people ask questions um, is part of the learning process. Okay, anything else on this? Yeah. I don't know how it relates, but I think that it's important for council to know what each department head's role truly is, like what they're overseeing and how those departments function. I think that just sitting in a setting of twice a month meeting, you don't get that full understanding of what staff is dealing with or what that staff report really means at the end of the day. But like I said, just council's understanding of the jobs, I think is critical. Yeah, so understanding the organization and the jobs. We're going to talk about that a little bit here in the next piece of the orientation. Sometimes that means, um, you know, chat with Alex about opportunities for that. Sometimes there's an opportunity for a ride along with a police officer or um, spending some time in one of the departments or meeting with the department heads directly to have to be able to get that overview. So I don't again. I just want to make sure that was in red, not blue. It's council's oh, responsibility. Oh. I think it's kind of both, really. Okay. I, I think it's I think staff has a responsibility to help council understand and council has a responsibility to educate themselves on it. Okay. Now we're ready to shift. We'll come back to that again at the end um, when we talk about the team agreement. Let's see if I can remember my tech tutorial. Please. Uh, Why don't you guys take five minutes so I can just, I'm going to transfer this over to a different machine so that this is not the power of the hill.
On the last section, I was kind of talking about if I have a quick question like Dave, like, hey, how many gallons of that tank you were mentioning? Should I email you first? Like I'll email to go to you first and then you'll well, something like that is we just I you just CC me. Yeah. Yeah. Easy stuff like that. And that's kind of what I'm seeing a lot of the time. It's usually just a quick question. I'm CC. I don't I don't feel I don't see that as as problematic. No, if it's quick. If I haven't been sure, I've also called out. Like yeah, that's true. I'm curious about something with Lori or, you know, and Can she'll I, say, why don't we just set up a meeting? Or, oh, yeah, go ahead and give them a call. So if I'm not sure, I just. Yeah, and then I'll just let the staff yeah. member know, like, hey, you know, I did get a call from so and so and they had this question, so I had them to reach out. Yeah, best practice is if you always just speak out if you so that she knows how to support her team. And also, to be fair, with um, and to kind of be respectful about the request, you know, think about the why, try to stay in that, that policy lane and be clear about the data that you need and why it is that you need. Okay, uh, council orientation. So we did this, we created this a couple of years ago, 2021, to just kind of help the council understand um, just that you guys have a community vision, you have a charter, like there's all of these things that guide the council's work that have been in place for some time. And so again, just it's just some grounding. Uh, we already we talked about the goals too. So we put the slides in here on that. Committees and boards that further other groups that you also interact with. So we're going to just highlight how those work. Um, the municipal law framework. This is where Pete's going to answer all of his questions. And then just understanding just the ins and outs of council meetings and and how those work. So the city's charter. It's it's essentially your like municipal constitution. It's what creates the city. It's what provides the authority. Um, it defines, so it defines your organization, your powers, your functions, a lot of the essential procedures. I think it's about 10 pages long, so you're going to be too bad. Um, and I think, is there a copy in that packet? There's a copy of it in the packet in your materials as well. So as we go through some of this content, you may want to reference some of that because it comes directly from the charter. Um, it is like your most important legal document that exists and it's an outline of the structure. The only way you can change the charter is and occasionally cities do um, some charter review and some cleanup because sometimes there can be some archaic stuff that gets in there. I think the Sorry, last this update was what 2000 and oh the charter the charter 11. Um sorry it's the charter's not in the packet. Sorry. Exactly. It's just well, the we put in the municipal code that's specific to the council. I have a copy of it if somebody wants it if you want to flip through it. Um and I think the, I, from the last time you did this, I think the last time you guys maybe updated it was around 2011-ish. Don't quote me on that, but roughly. So it hasn't been that long since it's been booked at. Um, and so in order to update the charter, usually there's uh, some public process that goes with it. And then you ultimately, you need the voters to approve any amendments that you make. Um, Can I ask a question then? So when there was a revision to the way that the Committees were established and function. That's not the that's not the charter. Okay. So the charter really sets out your form of government. Right. So it sets out how many city councilors there are, the duties of like the mayor versus a councilor versus the city administrator. It's really broad brushstrokes. And then depending on when the charter was drafted, there's some communities that have like the vision and values of the community. For instance. Gearhart's charter states that um, they don't want tourism. So that's like a, uh, you know, so that's the sort of thing that could be in there. Um, and then the charter um, 
And then the, the other piece of that, and it's easy to confuse the two, is you also have the comprehensive plan. And that's all the land use stuff that says how you're going to grow. So it's those two documents. One is on how you govern, and the other is like how you're going to grow that kind of form the basis. Um, as far as things like what committees you have, they're the committees that are required by state law, like your budget committee. Um, and then they're the ones that you can just do because you can, because you choose to have a committee. So, so there's a lot of those are, a lot of those are outlined in by ordinance where you create an ordinance that establishes the purpose of that committee and maybe like what, why they exist and how they're formed and what their membership looks like. Um, the other thing with the chart that's not in the charter, so the charter might allude to some high level stuff. And then where the details come in are typically like in your council rules. So some of the policies and procedures that you said that you guys as a council can revisit anytime and update. Um, usually that can be a heavy lift on staff to, to help the council. It takes a lot of time. So it takes council capacity as well as organizational capacity to go through those conversations and help you guys update your rules. But that's where it gets into some of the more nuanced detail stuff. And that's easier to change. There's a lot of procedural things that come up in there to help guide the body and how you actually operate. Okay, the city's vision. So this is another thing that not every not every city has one of these, but Scapus has one that you guys worked on and it hasn't been that long since 2016. Yeah. So 2016 was when you created it. You guys are currently doing your 50 year plan. Mm -hmm. Um, re looking at that, but this is how it stands today. I'm not going to read that very long paragraph, but um, you can read it if you'd like. Ultimately, the purpose of the vision is it serves as your roadmap for how a community wants to look and feel and function. There's some high level themes in there around smart growth and lifelong learning, sustainable economy, a connected community, a caring community, local pride, passionate stewardship. And you guys have, there was a, a citizen committee that came together to do some public outreach and inform how this was created and how it's used. So there was a lot of community discussion in creating this and you guys are doing that now as you work on uh, your 50 year plan. I have a question. Uh, it looks, sounds a little different from, is this vision on the website? I think it is. Yes. It just, okay. It just looks, sounds a little different. It's in the back book. It's in the book too. Okay. But I'm just wondering if it's on the website. It is. Uh, we talked about the, the council manager form of government. We already went over that in detail. Um, so again, just to remind you, legislative authority resides with the council, administrative functions carried out by the city manager. Those roles are outlined in the charter. Um, so that, that's what establishes the form of that form of government. This is your organizational chart. I'll let Alex just talk a little bit about how the organization is structured. Sure. Um, so obviously, as you can see, um, as far as council is concerned, you are hiring and firing the city manager, city attorneys, um, the auditor, as well as the municipal court judge. Um, you have your advisory boards. Um, and then um, under the supervision of the city manager, you have your administrative department, police, community development, and public works. Um, and then obviously within those umbrellas, you have some more specific items. Um, you know, in community development, you're going to have um, your engineering, planning, building official, things like that, public works. You've got water, wastewater, field services. Um, and in administration, we'll have, you know, really primarily city hall, um, you know, city recorder, our finance administrator, uh, things like that. So a couple things underneath those larger umbrellas. Any questions about organizational structure? What is our current population? Just over 8,000. <laughs> Sorry. Thank you. Not the number. Okay. And so for anybody more on that slide. Uh, as far as staff roles, so we talked about the city manager, administrative head of city government, Appointed by council based on qualifications, hires and fires all staff under it within the organization. So, um, puts the budget together based on the on the direction the council provides. City attorney again selected by and responsible to the council. So legal services. This one's important. Assigned by the majority of the council or the city manager. So you can't like individually direct. Same as same with the city manager. You can't like individually direct the city manager. The direction has to come from the body. So I think 
because you know there's like an hour requirement in your council rules. Two hours, two hours. hours. Yeah. Two, if it's going to require more than two hours of time, um, that the body has to approve that. And with the city attorney, similar, you have it has to be direction from the body. You can't really direct the city attorney to do whatever you want to do. Uh, city recorder serves as the clerk for the council. And then um, under staff support, so requests from counselor for staff assistance shall be presented to the mayor or city manager. Um, it, it needs to be approved. Individual counselors, as I mentioned, don't direct the activities or work with staff members and don't get into personnel stuff. Can I ask a question? Sure. Are uh, staff positions on just open contracts or are there certain ones that have to be renewed? Or how does that work? Um, so your attorneys are contracted. Um, I am on a contract right now. It does automatically renew until it's ended uh, by either party. And then for the remainder of staff, they are not on contracts specifically. They are just hired and um, follow the guidelines and under the personal policy manual. Okay. And you okay. guys have some bargaining units? Yes, we have yeah. two unions. Um, we've asked me um, for some public work staff are in that, um, some of the planning department, and then we do have the police union. Thanks. That's helpful. Yeah. Um, so then, like, if you're hiring a, a police chief, is there a committee then that you put together to help with the interview process and, and stuff? And then you hire, um, or does the council then approve your hire? Same with a planner or public works, or those completely just interviewed by you? Sure. So um, with those types of positions, the final decision is mine. It's not council's, but um, especially with a position like you know, say a public works director or police chief in particular, um, I've always been really mindful to make sure that we're getting, I mean, and I am getting lots of input. So like, for instance, when we just hired the police chief, um, he actually had a public Zoom panel for people to meet him and then council could sit in on those. Um, and that way I could get feedback from the community on what they thought. And then the actual interview panels, you know, there's groups of folks that would interview him um, with me doing a final um, interview at the end, but we always try to get lots of input. I mean, even um, even just, uh, you know, lower level positions, like even the lieutenant or, you know, when we hired Isaac, for instance, we had interview panels so that I'm getting feedback from multiple parties on on what they think. And those are scored and given to me and, sh and then I can see the notes and um, and then we, you know, we go by feedback and scores. Alex, on this interview panel, is it a combination of community members or who is it? So typically speaking, it's going to be folks that are um, either are going to work with that position closely and or are experts in that field. And it's kind of that mix. So, for instance, when um, we went through the chief process, you know, we had, you know, I was on the panel, but we had um, uh, other police officers and um, I had Dave, I think, was on there. Um, people that were going to work closely with that position and people who had expertise in that position. That's those are really what I need to hear from in order to make a good hire. Which is really, this is really typical in any organization, council manager, form of government. It's, uh, I don't know that I've really heard of any interview panels that include council members unless it's a first city manager position. And, and, and to be fair, again, with the police chief, I did make sure that in that process there were public um, yeah. Zoom calls that people, the councilors and community could call in on and ask questions. They did get that opportunity with the police yeah. chief position, but that's not typical for the rest of the positions. That's just a very public facing once we did it with that. Uh, but yes, when I, when I'm doing the panels, I'm really looking for people who are going to be working for them closely, working with them closely, and have expertise in that area. Other questions about that? Okay. Um, so as far as council rules, so there's some stuff that's also outlined uh, in your documents on you know what what is different about the mayor's role. So again, you guys are one body; you make decisions as as a body. The authority lies there, but there are some some additional um, responsibilities outlined. So the mayor um, presides over the council's deliberations, so essentially facilitates the council meetings. Um, and the mayor in this situation does get to vote on all questions before the council, preserves the order. So any council rules that you set, it is the mayor's role to enforce those at the meeting um, and determine the order of business, appoints committees with approval of the council and signs all the ordinances. Involved or some specific mayoral roles. Yes, Megan. I would just add that something that we don't do that that role only does is they approve uh, what comes before council on the agenda. So 
if perhaps there was something that uh, we wanted on the agenda, but the mayor didn't, uh, he could, uh, you know, he could choose not to put it on the agenda. But if there were three of us that did want it at least on the agenda, that would sort of, I just want to make sure that what is put before council is really what is determined by the mayor with, with staff. But yeah, and part of that, I mean, so I, this is a question that comes up a lot. We have a lot of discussion about how stuff gets on the agenda when you're doing the Beaverton governance training. You guys are setting your agenda right now by virtue of setting your goals. I mean, that is really how staff determines the work plan, how they decide the flow of agenda items that need to things that have timelines, right? So there's, you know, it's not, everything's not under the sole influence of the city. Sometimes there's regional partners and other groups that you work with or consultants you're working with. So a project has a timeline that truly dictates kind of how the agendas are structured. There may be other issues that come up, but then the mayor has some additional authority to say like, okay, we need to, we need to discuss this topic and it needs to get on this agenda. But the council also has this influence through the process of goal setting for getting things on the agenda to clarify that. So technically, yes, that is how it works, but also know that the council is heavily influencing that by the work you're doing today. Does anyone other cities have expectations and goals for their mayor? Like, can they set goals for me or expectations of what they, what they expect from me? Typically what, how that works is through, um, again, through this goal setting process, but defining any additional responsibilities that you might have through the council goals, um, through council goal updates. Not typically, I mean, this is what you guys have outlined here is very common what you can see in other documents that are listed. Council liaison, so, uh, oh, let's stop. Council president, I took that one. So, every, each odd number of year, you guys select your council president, selected by majority vote, council president, doesn't really have special powers other than to deliver to facilitate the council meeting in the absence of the mayor. Can I ask you a question? Sure. Um, did we are we appointed annually? Seems like we did or my I think it's every other. That says every other year, but I feel like we did it last year and then again this year. Maybe I'm wrong. If you had changeover in your council and there was, if the, I guess nodding its head, if the, if the previous council president went off the council, then that could have been why it happened again. Oh, because because Kessie left. Yeah. 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 yeah, typically it's every other someone left. Patrick, yeah, so if you have if you have turnover, it could get you a little off track. But based on how it's written in your uh, in your documents, it's odd number of years unless you've got some sort of exception. And then council liaisons. So these are liaisons um, to your commit to a committee, an advisory board, maybe a task force that the council creates. So those are appointed by the mayor. Um, and and it's the role of that really is to maintain that connection between what's happening at the council level and then bringing back to the council um, what's happening with that group, that advisory group, committee, or task force. Uh, so it's about facilitating communication uh, between those groups in the council. City committee. Um, so I have the, these five listed. Do you guys still have the 100-year anniversary committee? No. That one's been, yeah. Celebrated. I have a slate show. I should have been that. Yeah. Uh, yes, should have been that. Yeah. Do you guys have any other ad hoc ones in place right now? The 50 year. The 50 yeah. year plan. Okay, so you have your uh, in your you have ordinances that have to find um, your economic development committee, a parks and recreation committee, planning commission is one that's established by state law, Oregon state law that you have a planning, um, a group that does that work, as well as the budget committee. And then any ad hoc committees that you all create. So no longer 100 year anniversary, but replaced with a 50 year plan group. Um, yeah. Do we do go over those committees today and work on liaisons for that? Because on, on Monday's meeting, we have to vote, or do we do that afterwards? And yes, we have that on the. Okay. Yeah, I don't know if we have it specifically on there, but we can spend some time. Yes. Um, some best practices for committee liaisons. Uh, taking time to discuss agenda items with staff prior to race. So if you have a committee meeting and you see an agenda item on there that you're not familiar with, make sure you're connecting with your staff liaison so that you know, kind of have some background information on what's going. 
liaisons should not be voting on committee deliberations. You guys are there most primarily to listen. So again, think about that, um, that power imbalance, that power dynamic. You are the elected official. These are community volunteers. So uh, I've seen it function best when you're there to listen and unless you're being asked specific questions to, um, to just kind of sit back and take a back seat. And then just provide updates on what's happening at the council level. And then making sure that you give a report at some level to the council about what's happening through committee activities. Should I ask a question on that? So, to report, to listen, what about give input? I don't know. Uh, to the committee? Yeah, yeah all right. At, right. At the time of meeting. And unless it's directed from the council, that's not really your role. You have an opportunity to provide input on things at the council level. So it really kind of takes time away from the applicant opportunity away from that those committee members. But it's not unless they're specifically asking for your input on something. Uh, I would I would uh, discourage that. Um, I see the planning committee or budget committee and planning commission are absent from our list for council liaisons. Is there? Well, you're all part of budget committee. Okay, you, like you and some community members make up the budget committee. Okay. You're already on there. And the planning commission is a separate body. Right. So the the reason none of would be a liaison is if they make a decision that gets appealed to you. Right. Then then you're depending on the decision, you don't have to make a decision in the capacity of the city council. Um, so for the 50 year committee, for example, we have a city council seat on that committee. I just want to differentiate in between. Potential different committees here, so in that situation on 50 year, I think we're actually expected to vote. So there can be I, all that to say there can be different situations where council members that are appointed to committees that actually have a seat on the committee would vote, correct? Yes, I think it's yeah, yeah. And, and that should be defined. So if you haven't read your um, the liaison assignment, like the ordinance that established that committee or um, the direction that created the task force. If you have not read that to make sure that it's clear, because those ad hoc ones, you're right, but sometimes those are formed with some different expectations. I would imagine that the other couple that are up here, um, the expectations would be the same. That you don't provide that that level of input or vote on stuff. Yeah, no, I just so just make sure you're familiar with whatever your appointment is that you know kind of how to interact and engage with that group. I understand the purpose here. I just want to make sure that everybody's on the same page that there might be situations on certain committees where count counselors are have appointed seats where that is appropriate. Right. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Municipal law framework. Okay. So um, I'll just kind of go over the high level points and uh, Peter can weigh in on uh, the details here. So you got cities have so city authority. So those cities have those powers expressed in or implied from the constitution. So where do you where do you derive power from? Constitution, Oregon revised statutes, or the charter? And the charter. Um, anything, any questions about that or anything, any discussion on that point? Municipal powers are um, categorized in a couple different ways. Peter, I don't know if you want to just kind of cover what these things, what these pieces mean. So intramural powers are within the city. An extramural would be like if if you have a water tank that's outside of the jurisdiction, but you're bringing in pipes or something like that. Or there's also um, can be a, a urban growth management area. So the county said that you're responsible for this area that's outside of the city. Um, and generally that requires coordination between planning staff and the county. Um, the governmental proprietary proprietary would be like services that you provide like water where people are paying the city. Um, legislative are things that can be also be referred to the voters. So something that would be citywide. Um, administrative would be something like, do you want to um, apply for a grant and then quasi judicial those are land use decisions that are defined so it'll be um, either 
one project or if it's a limited number of acres, those are usually quasi-judicial. If it's something that applies citywide, like whether you want to establish a transient lodging tax, so a tax for you know short-term rentals, that would be legislative. And the quasi-judicial process is dictated by the state. So I know there's some questions around that. There's questions that it's because it's confusing and there's a lot of steps and detail that go to it, but it's it's outlined by state. And the, the other thing I'd say is that Oregon was the first state to have home rule powers, which the idea was to protect cities from the tyranny of the legislature. I mean, that's how they described it at the time, which was the early 20th century. Um, but those powers have slowly eroded by what's called state preemption. So um, more and more of the authority to act as you would want within your city, the legislature, particularly if they declare an emergency, can take those powers away. And so like the example that I would give is um, in the early 20th century, cities all had their own alcohol taxes. And when prohibition ended, the state declared an emergency and said a city can't have the city can't have an alcohol tax. Um, it has it's taxed statewide, which is why um, everybody pays the same amount for a bottle of Smirnoff, regardless of where they are in the state and regardless of what use they're using it for. Delegation of power. So uh, this comes into play. You'll see it like in your council rules or in ordinances, where sometimes the council will delegate a power to staff to, to be able to efficiently administrate on stuff. And so, but they can be delegated vertically or horizontally. So legislative power can't be delegated. So that's a good example of. I mean, so the, the city, the power over legislation is to the city council and that's the Oregon constitution. That's also um, the Oregon Revised Statutes and your charter says that as well. And I think that's pretty broadly accepted, though it appeared that the city of Portland delegated their legislative power to a uh, charter review committee because they required themselves to put, um, if it was more than two thirds, required themselves to put it on the ballot. So there's some areas where it can be gray, but generally city councils would want to keep that power themselves. And the expectation of representative government is they elected you to make that category of decisions. Um, and they can then, if they don't like your decision and it's legislative, they can refer it to the ballot if they collect enough signatures. But unless the voters say no, the power is yours over any city legislation. Um, the other piece here, so as far as that administrative power, it can be performed by the council. I don't know if this is a good example or not, correct me if I'm wrong, but like business license, for example, those are probably, do you guys do business licenses here? Yeah. So staff typically approves and processes those, but I suppose if the council really wants to yeah, approve every single business license, you could do that. Probably not the most efficient, you know, use of your time. So that's something administratively that staff does. Um, so administrative power, yes. Council can do things. I think we need to just weigh whether or not that makes sense. And it's typically a, a lot of those things are delegated to staff consultants or committees. And we just want to make sure it's delegated to trained, experienced professional staff. And there's obviously limitations on power. So federal, state, judicial limitations in what you can and cannot do. And the thing about preemption is it flows downstream, not upstream. So that if the federal federal government says you can or can't do something, that supersedes the state saying it, and then the state supersedes um, what the city says. And the reason I mentioned that is because there have been, the county did a couple of things that, that seemingly were preempted by federal and state law, um, which is why we didn't take a position on any of those things when litigation happened. But uh, you, you have to be careful about that. Uh, power and responsibility of council members. So we already talked about this. No individual uh, power it can only act as one body. Um, acting without authority. It's just important to understand that because acting without authority can cause personal and city liability. 
Supervision of staff. So again, individual members have no authority to direct staff, consultants, contractors, or administrative activities without authority from the governing body. Uh, decision making process. So there's different types of decisions. Um, there's the legislative, as Peter already mentioned, that constitutes law or policy. There's administrative decisions that you carry out. Um, and so those help to administer those previous adopted laws or policies. Uh, and then the quasi judicial piece. And that is that's where it comes into play with the land use stuff. And you have to comply with the state and federal due process. Um, as far as the decision making process, it's highlighted in parliamentary procedure and council rules. So parliamentary procedure, um, some councils use Robert rules of orders, others draft their own version or use some hybrid of that. And the council determines what procedural rules to employ. I forget what you guys use here, some hybrid of that. A hybrid, it's, yeah. And that was recently updated. Yeah, and, the, and the mayor and facilitating the meetings um, is responsible for making sure that that plays out, usually with support from staff, because Rob, if I don't know if anybody's ever seen Robert's rules of order, it's, it's just, it's, there's a lot to it, confusion, that's why cities use hybrids and figure out what they need to effectively run the meeting. Council rules, that's again, where it really outlines some of the policies. Um, and it just contains some basic stuff around the dates, times, and place of meetings, how your agenda is formatted, um, who's responsible for creating the agenda. We talked about that. Decorum and participation obligations of the public and council. So what does public comment look like? What are the expectations that we talked about attendance at meetings? That's outlined in your council rules. Um, and then what happens if you disrupt a meeting? How, did, how is that handled? So those are all things found in the council rules. As far as your decision making process, so there's a couple different forms of action that can be taken. You can adopt ordinances that adopt a policy or a law. Those are different from resolutions. Resolutions um, express policies or opinions of the council, um, or to or like provide this overarching direction to approve something such as a contract or a major expenditure of funds. So imagine when you guys hired your consultants for your 50 year plan, there's probably resolution that came forward. So an ordinance can be referred by the voters because it's city legislation. So if you um, like if you were to increase the tax or something like that, then voters have 30 days to file with the county whether they want to and the city whether they want to try and collect the signatures necessary to refer it. And then they have 90 days from when the decision was made. And so that's why your ordinances don't go into effect for 30 days unless you have an emergency clause, because you're giving those electors the opportunity to try and refer it. Um, and then if they try and refer it within those 30 days, then it doesn't go into effect for another 60 because you want to see whether they've collected the signature necessary to put it on the ballot or not. Um, so that's why there's some things that you can use an emergency clause on. And other things like increasing a tax that you can't because voters have the right under state law in order to refer those decisions that they want. Uh, it's just to clarify this because I've seen this get really confusing for elected officials. So you have ordinances, you have resolutions. An example, of, like a recent example I saw of resolutions that a lot of cities were passing on things like around sanctuary, sanctuary cities. Um, uh, but and then you have proclamations, which are I see people get those confused sometimes. Proclamations are very like ceremonial things that the council is celebrating something and proclaiming, you know, maybe a group did something amazing in the community and you want to recognize that great service. That's proclamation. Resolution is slightly more official than that, and ordinance is really official. So it's you're actually taking action on it. Motion. Um, so you use that to place a matter before the council for consideration. Make a motion it's procedural rather than something that's written so if you're going to make a motion sometimes it helps to write it out ahead of time uh, or um, sometimes staff can provide support in that so that the motion comes through clear so the council knows what staff is they're voting on and then voting a uh, majority of the council members present um, to adopt the motion so a motion's made it's seconded 
and then the majority of the group votes on it, approves it. If it fails, then sometimes you'll see another motion made, something, some alternative, or it just fails and no action is taken. Um, so you have to make a motion, you have to vote to, to adopt a resolution or to adopt a motion, a resolution, or an ordinance for taking your action. Questions about that? Open meetings. So the purpose here is to make sure that meetings of these bodies are, are open to the public so that every, so for transparency's sake, so that people know what's going on and um, know what the people they elected uh, know what they're doing. So here I just want to highlight a couple of that and very important things about open meetings. Yeah, so where where folks get into trouble is if they hit reply all on emails in particular because if if it looks like people are deliberating towards a vote, um, that can be really problematic. Uh, there's a case out of Lane County called the Handy case where it appeared that the Lane County commissioners were meeting um, to decide issues beforehand. So they were meeting in like groups of twos or threes, which they unfortunately described as book club on their calendars. And then what was book club? It was people getting together to discuss county business. So. That's another thing is that if you guys are debating an issue outside of a public meeting, it it can cause um, major problems for yourselves individually um, and for the city. Um, and so, and this is if there's actually a decision. So it's not it's not saying like, hey, I think we should maybe discuss, you know active outdoor recreation like maybe like is that something we should think about as a city this is like you have an application in front of you you have um an appeal in front of you there's specific business in front of you you really just it's a best practice not to discuss it with each other outside of the meeting at all yeah you can't like take the temperature of your your teammates here <laughs> you need people for coffee or beers and be like what are you you know how you feel about that policy we have to go up you can't do that you can talk about the, like issues but like you said that are not before you but you can't take the temperature of the group that's deliberating outside of the get to know each other talk about other stuff which is not that it's really when you have a majority the idea is kind of like the game of telephone where one person is having a conversation with somebody and then that person is having a conversation with somebody and it gets to four. And so you know how it's going to go in advance. And there are city councils that their city, every city council meeting lasts 15 minutes. And maybe it's because they just are super decisive, but you know, <clears throat> the optics to the public, it makes it seem like the decision has been made in advance. And that's when you have real problems because the public wants to be able to weigh in and participate. Yeah, just quick. Um, like then if I want to know, hey, parks, if we want to talk about this park. We want to talk about grab board and, and vote on a design. And I ask one, two, three people if they're interested in putting that on an agenda, not what they think about it. And they all say, yes, it goes on the agenda. Well, we vote on the agenda. Are we still OK? I mean, I'm not asking their opinion or we're going to we're going to decide what we're voting on but are we are we in agreement we're ready to talk about grab board and put it on the agenda so the decision to have the discussion you don't have to worry about that what you have to worry about is i'm going to put i'm thinking about putting grab horn on the agenda person's like yeah it seems like a good idea and then you're like I really think an alignment that has pickleball courses is a great idea, and that's what we should do. And then that person will be like, yeah, it's the fastest growing sport in America. And you know, next thing you know, if you have that conversation enough times, you essentially take the decision outside of the meeting. Does that help? Yeah. yeah, it's about helping you all stay out of trouble, okay? One question. Uh, so does that mean if we're, if I'm having coffee with Tyler, we can't talk about pickleball courts. No, you can talk about pickleball courts because pickleball is not on the city agenda. It's not business in front of the city, and and it's not like they're for you having a conversation. Okay. Yeah. So if we the two of us, we can talk about city matters as well as we don't try to coax each other into. It really like it is it is on the agenda. Where where people really get into trouble is when it's organized. 
So it's not just two of you having a conversation or going on a walk and having a discussion. It's when there's some, you know, something's going to be on the agenda and you're seeking to figure out how people are going to vote or have that conversation in order to get them to yes before the meeting. Because proof is a major issue with these cases. Like, were the, was Lane County really having these conversations? What evidence is there? I represented a city where a majority of the city council meetings were all out, or councilors' cars were all outside of a building. And somebody took a picture of it and was like, they are discussing city business. And it's like, what proof is there that they are? And it wasn't it. So I don't know why a majority of them were all outside of an auto body shop, but they were. And they all insisted they were not discussing city business. But if you, where it's electronic, that's where it's no longer saying, well, it was just Tyler. I haven't discussed pickleball with anyone else and we don't have it on the agenda. If people are typing into emails, hey, uh, a bunch of us need to get behind this because this is becoming a problem. And here's what I think we should do. And then somebody hits reply and says, absolutely. I mean, if you get that email, and I hope you don't, but the, the response is, this doesn't seem like something we can discuss outside of a public meeting. Uh, maybe it can go on the agenda. So what I would ask you to do is like affirmatively acknowledge that you're not debating towards a result in that email, because otherwise if someone files public records request and they get the email and they're like, they're deliberating towards a decision, and then the burden of proof has shifted onto us to prove that you're not. Um, and so that becomes a much harder, and that's true of any electronic communication, so tax, um, emails, whatever it is. I, Peter, I just want to be clear. This becomes an issue, though, when it reaches four and more counselors, right? Because it's, then it's a quorum issue. Yeah, no, if you, um, and again, their categories like land use is special because it's quasi judicial and you're supposed to act as judges versus as legislators. But it's yeah, if once you get to a quorum of the council and you all know how you're going to vote on an issue, that's when you have a problem. Like you and Pete may think that pickleball should be a priority or softball field should be a priority. Generally speaking, that's different than we need to vote to put a softball field on this park. So like saying we want to emphasize active outdoor recreation as a community. That's not like a specific. That's different than like a we have a plan for this park. It's X and I'm voting for it. And so are you or four of us know that we're all going to approve this park design in advance because we've had conversations with each other. Thank you. All right. Um, the open meetings are important. Stay on the show. Mm -hmm. Okay, public records also important. Uh, so this is to make sure that all records of a, of a city or public agency, with some exceptions around personnel and confidential stuff, are available for inspection and copying by the public. Um, so this applies to all bodies. Let's see. What are some highlights of it as far as the council needs to know on public records? Don't use your personal email to discuss city business because it might make it so that the city staff has to review all of your personal emails. If you get an email sent to your personal email, reply, copy in your city account and say, please send me emails regarding city business to my city councilor account. And that that's how we can keep your personal emails from us having to review them for city business. Um, and so that's why we give you guys uh, city council emails. Social media guidance. There's there's really mixed advice on social media as far as blocking people from your social media, as far as what's public and private. Um, and all of these laws, both public meetings and public records, were done post Watergate, and so none of them really anticipated the way that we communicate now. I mean, back then people were sending each other letters via the mail and um, they weren't thinking about people having a conversation on Slack. So um, the AG provides us with guidance, but I would just say, you know, if, if you have a 
um, social media as a counselor, that's where you would put and it hopefully just be like, hey, we have Adventure Fest coming up. Um, if you have a personal thing, it's the same as your personal email, kind of keep your personal compartmentalized, keep your city compartmentalized. And that'll just make it far more efficient when we get those public records. And same thing with text, right? With yeah. phone. And so we do we all have uh, city phones? No. no, there was a couple of mm -hmm. people offered to use them. Ethics, conflict of interest. So, um, any action, decision, and a recommendation by a public official, including staff, um, which could be a, a correct benefit or a warning detriment, is those are potential conflicts of interest. And so there's potential conflicts of interest, and there's actual conflicts of interest where um, if the person would be benefiting or avoiding detriment of the person or person relative or business. So I don't know if there's a good example here. I had one last week. So there, there's a city that's doing, um, they're looking at their transportation system plan and their four different road alignments. And one of the road alignments went across one of the planning commissioner's properties. And so that was an example where um, the planning commissioner did not believe they had a conflict of interest and did not want to call the Oregon <laughs> Government's Ethics Commission. So we called the Oregon Government's Government Ethics Commission because I was concerned <clears throat> about liability in the city. Um, and they said that was an actual conflict of interest and that member would have to recuse themselves from all elements of the decision. So if you have a question, it's really important to call the OGC. They can get you probably um, uh, advice that day. They can usually get you a written opinion within two days and it gives you safe harbor. So in the event that they determine you don't have a problem and later someone alleges that you do and a court then says you do, the fact that you relied upon that state you know, agency tasked with this, um, matters just greatly. So when in doubt, call them. They're they're friendly, they're helpful, and they're quite prompt. So in the event, conflict of interest, you would have stayed in the road. And I would say it's probably more common in a small town. We all, you know, a lot of us have family here, extended family, and it might be perceived that uh, to somebody else, well, that's your cousin or, you know, or something right. where, you know, your wife is paid by that person or, you know, just always check, especially with the connections in this small town. The other thing is just having the ability to say, you know, I called the Oregon Government Ethics Commission about this because I wanted to make sure that I could participate. It's the same thing with any elections communications. We go to the Secretary of State's office because then if people say you're engaging in advocacy, I can say we went through the Secretary of State's neutrality review. They determined this was um, neutral. And that will oftentimes prevent someone from either making the claim or, or suing the city. Is that like a budget committee member's husband works for the city and she's voting on a budget that could affect their pay? And yeah, I mean, that would be um, that would be an example. Or if you require a certain building material where there's only one like in a design code where you say, well, we want this sort of thing and, and there's only one person that sells it. Um, those are the kind of examples where they'll come up. There was one where you know what you typically know what decisions that are coming forward on an agenda. And so you have some advanced notice of things that you're going to have to be deciding on. So if there's a question, you just need to reach out and check in. That's the best practice. Question. Uh, I think I know the answer to this, but uh, I know there have been times on different boards where uh, a spouse of one of the employees in the jurisdiction uh, is on the board. Is there a problem with that, or when, did, when would they have to declare their uh, conflict of interest? It's when it's to their financial benefit or to their financial disadvantage is really when you're having those issues. So if if the value of um, like your property 
Um, so if like there's a zone change that would impact the value of property you own, that's an example where even if you think you can neutrally decide the issue, you need to recuse yourself. Um, and, you know, again, it's sometimes it's counterintuitive, um, like the, the OGC in a different jurisdiction, which had never provided their volunteers with, um, like liability insurance, um, they, all the OGC said that all volunteers except the city councilors could get the insurance. And I was like, the insurance is for the benefit of the city, not the, you know, the volunteers really, because we get, so we will, we'll, don't get sued. And, but they, um, they came up with a really interesting rule that it, the city's always provided that insurance for the council. You can continue to, but if you haven't, then you can vote to insure a future city council, but you can't vote to insure yourselves. So it's just, again, like that's not how I thought it was going to end up. And it kind of illustrates the importance um, of calling them because it's not always crystal clear. There's a lot of ambiguity sometimes. Yeah, maybe during lunch, we can share the number of the different contacts and we'll just have it as a favorite and you can call them. Yes, yeah, and it's in the packet. Um, under the legal stuff, the oh. and you have no issues dealing with that this year. Uh, council meeting 101. So, you guys have your meeting scheduled for first and third Mondays of the month. Um, if it qualifies that holiday, so it falls on the holiday, the meeting will be the next business day. The meetings are typically seven to nine, unless I'm looking for adopted to continue it beyond that. Forum, you have to have a forum to meet. The forum is more than 50% of the members of the entire council, so that's four. Um, agendas prepared by the mayor and city manager. Councilors may request that specific items be added, so we already kept that. Pretty basic stuff. Council meetings, um, you get meeting minutes, those are prepared by the city recorder. It includes motions, proposals, resolutions, orders, ordinances, and rules proposed. Results of the vote. So it's not like for it's not it's not like a court reporter where it's like verbatim minutes, it's more action oriented, but you guys do have audio recording. I can listen to all the details. Proclamations approved by the mayor right before council. Uh, they do not encumber you financially or conflict with any ordinance, resolution, state, federal regulation or administrative rule, and then uh, other any other procedural matter not covered by the charter or council rule, that's, you guys figure that out through your Robert. Okay, it's the end. Any other questions remaining? Right. We're a little, little behind, but that's, it's almost lunchtime, so I think um, so lunch here and ready. You need to get to the they're, they're, they're setting up. They're setting up. Okay. So before I think before we launch into something else, it's probably wise just to take the lunch break. But let's talk about what's coming next so we can be efficient in our, our use of time. So we'll do some accomplishments. And so maybe to get ahead of that, to talk about some 2022 accomplishments, I'm going to pass around some file sticky notes. And what I want you to highlight on here, maybe just do this before lunch is an item, uh, an accomplishment that you're particularly proud of from the last year related to the city, not your personal fitness challenges or things like that, <laughs> city related stuff. Um, oh, you guys will need markers for this. So let me pass those back around. Yeah, that's going this way. And a couple going this way. Grab your favorite color. Okay. Um, so think about an accomplishment from 2022. And even though some of you weren't elected, you are in, in the community. So hopefully you've got something special to recognize. I know some of you serve on boards or commission. Yeah, a limit. A limit? <laughs> no, no limit. You can sit and write all during lunch if you want. But accomplishments are important to talk about because it sets a tone for success. It also helps you to recognize some some things that you may want to continue momentum on. Did you want one on each sheet or? Um, yeah, I try to keep one accomplishment for post-it because it helps if there's other things. So how are we going to use this? So we're not going to read it to the group? We, yeah, we'll share it with the group. That's why uh, I would I would 
just encourage you, these post-its are really big for a reason, right? Big on them, you can read them on here. Uh, also, if you use the markers, it's a lot easier to read than ink pen. If you don't have a marker, you can pass those back to our public safety crew. We're supposed to write an accomplishment we're proud of. From the last, yeah, from last year, something that was accomplished in the last year that we're really good about. And then um, lunch is almost all ready. So after you've got an accomplishment, jot it down. Go ahead. Any any details we need to know about lunch? It's ready to go whenever. Yeah. So after you have your accomplishment written down, go ahead and go grab some lunch. You guys, we have a half hour allocated for that. So we can go start back up at 12 to tea. Oh, okay. Sarah, hey, we're getting this back to you. I'm assuming post somewhere, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, we'll post all the accomplishments um, at the last.
exactly. January and really, it's just like you're not going to survive this retreat season. So, tennis shoes and tips. I'm trying to jazz it up a little bit. Uh, okay. So uh, before we broke from lunch, you guys were jotting down some accomplishments that you're proud of. So how we're gonna do this is we're gonna try to, I know I saw some of you were writing off the box. So we're gonna try to keep it to this side of the board. And if we need to um, expand over, we will. But I want you guys to share, come up, post your post-its, keep them kind of close together um, so that we have space for everybody and uh, and share some of the things that you're proud of. So this is a fairly quick exercise. So you don't need to give a dissertation on whatever the accomplishments were, otherwise it will never get done today. Um, so let's go ahead and I can see Alex is ready to jump out of her seat. So why don't you get us why don't you get us started, Alex? Put this up. And mind you, but that's okay. Um oh you want to so read them off and then put them up there? You can do it, you can put them up there oh. and talk about them as you put them up. Okay, well, I'll just go really, really quick. Super obvious. I said increased social media presence, uh, a lot of money infrastructure secured. Um, ARPA and then investing money. Um, we have a new finance administrator. She's really increasing a lot of efficiency with our administration. Um, she hired her police 